Today, by viewer request, we're taking a look at the best-selling Lexus in the lineup, the Lexus RX. The RX sells so well that in 2019, this outsold every other model in the Lexus lineup in North America by an insane margin. This outsold all of the sedans that Lexus sells here combined and accounts for a full third of all Lexus sales in North America. For this video, I've gotten my hands on my favorite version of the RX, the often lampooned RX 450 HL. The hybrid system, I think, fits the character of the Lexus RX the best, and it's going to give you the best fuel economy. And the L version is my favorite version of the RX because we get more room in the back, not really because of the third row. The biggest and most deserved complaint about the RXL is the third row. It is very, very small. If you've ever thought to yourself, I wish my RX had a teeny tiny little padded area where I could put my dog or some naughty children or my legless mother-in-law, that's what the third row in the RXL is about. But that said, I would still rather have a tiny third row than not have one at all, and that's not the only reason to buy the L. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about the outside. We have the Lexus Predator or Spindle Grill, whatever you want to call it right there, full LED headlamps and LED fog lamps below. The grill inside the spindle opening changes based on the different trim levels that you get. We're driving the hybrid model, so we have the grill you're looking at here, and the Lexus logo has a blue tint around it, indicating that we're in the hybrid model. At 196.9 inches long, the RXL is about the same length as the Acura MDX, but the two vehicles have very different missions in mind. The MDX was designed from the very beginning to be a three-row crossover, and the RX, until this model, has always been a two-row crossover. This, on the other hand, as its name would imply, is a stretched version of the RX. And the key thing to know is that they did not stretch the wheelbase. They just stretched the body right back here. You'll notice we have a much longer window in this area. It's not so much of a third row area window as it is more of a second row, second window right there. And then inside the newly stretched cargo area, they stuck a very, very teeny tiny third row. But this stretch solves one of the other problems about the regular RX, which is the cargo capacity. It doesn't have a great deal because of the swoopy profile that we found in this generation of the RX. If you get the two-row version, cargo capacity comes in at around 18 to 19 cubic feet or so. That's significantly below many of the other two-row crossovers out there. So if you're cross-shopping a regular RX against something like a BMW X3 or an Audi Q5 or a Volvo XC60, they have a much bigger cargo area in the back but in steps the RXL and it has nearly double the cargo capacity. The spindle grille theme from up front is mimicked out back with the shapes going on here. We have full LED tail lamp modules, including LED amber turn signals, but we don't get the sequential LED amber turn signals that we do find in other world markets. That particular implementation is not allowed in the United States, unfortunately. At the bottom of the bumper, you won't find any visible exhaust tips. They're tucked up under the bumper, but we do have what sort of looks like an homage, perhaps, to an exhaust tip. Lexus continues to be very aggressive at bringing a lot of the latest driver assistance features down into every trim level in the lineup, and for 2021, they've sweetened the pot a little bit for the RX, making blind spot monitoring and rear cross-traffic detection standard. That's in addition to all the features that were standard before, like radar adaptive cruise control, pre-collision autonomous braking, the automatic high beam system, and the aggressive lane centering. Whether you get the short RX or the long RX, the hybrid or the non-hybrid, you'll find a 3.5 liter naturally aspirated V6 engine under the hood. In the non-hybrid model, it's tuned to 295 horsepower, and it's mated to a standard eight-speed automatic transmission, setting power either to the front wheels or to all four wheels. If you get the hybrid model, then power goes down, but combined power goes up, thanks to the addition of three electric motors, two up front and then one in the rear. That gives us a combined horsepower output of 308. More important than the power bump to most people will be the fuel economy that comes in at 30 miles per gallon combined if you get the short RX, 29 if you get the long version. A key thing to keep in mind if you're debating between the all-wheel drive version of the non-hybrid and the all-wheel drive hybrid is that the hybrid system does not use a mechanical all-wheel drive system. Instead, this uses one of Lexus's e-all-wheel drive setups where there's an electric motor in the rear. This electric motor is rated for just under 70 horsepower. And the important thing about that is that this system can never send as much power to the rear axle, even when the front wheels are slipping, as the non-hybrid model can. And therefore, it's going to feel quite different out in slipperier situations, whether you're doing mild off-roading, or you're in mud, or you're in sand, or you're out there on snow or ice. Unquestionably, the e-all-wheel drive system is going to be much more capable than a front-wheel drive RX, but generally speaking, it's not quite as capable as the regular all-wheel drive system. 
Now let's dive into the seats. The front seats are pretty comfortable in the RX for longer road trips. I ended up doing a long road trip down to Santa Barbara in this to drive the all new Nissan Rogue. Be sure and check that video out. But these seats are not as adjustable as most of the mainline European competition. So we don't find inflatable bolsters or extending thigh cushions or available seat massage or anything like that. Just a two way lumbar support and a three position memory over there on the door. But the passenger seat has about the same range of motion as the driver's seat. The RX is available as a five, a six, or a seven passenger crossover. The five passenger version is a short one. The long one is available with either six or seven seats. This one is the six seat version. So we have captain's chairs here in the second row. They are a little bit more comfortable than the bench seat, but they're not as bucket shaped as I thought they would be. They do have more of a range of motion. So if I scoot this forward, just for the purposes of demonstrating the recline, you can see how reclined they are. They also have an inboard armrest that's independent from one another. And then there's a very tiny walkway in between with a little rug on there to help you get back to the third row. But before I do that, I'm over on the right side of the car, the front seat's all the way back in its track, suitable for a six foot five person. You can see I have about three inches of legroom left. And now we come to the emergency seats. Again, bear in mind this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. I had three inches approximately of legroom right there with that second row. I'm gonna attempt to hop back here in the third row. You'll notice in the RX versus RXL conversion that the doors don't change. That is a little bit of a problem because typically three row crossovers have a bit more of a square opening profile right there. And this definitely has a rake right here that makes it so that you end up bopping your head on there quite frequently compared to something like the MDX. Then I'm gonna need to kick off my shoes for this and practice my yoga poses because if we try and move this seat all the way back, then you will notice that the second row seat back is actually touching the third row seats and let's just say this isn't possible. So instead let's talk about what might be possible. So if I were to try and sit back here admittedly with my knees practically in my chest and then give myself ooh, no leg room at all knees touching that seat back right there head right there against the ceiling. Let's see where the other seats in the car would need to be. Although before we move up there, I should mention that the third row gets its own climate control zone, which is a little bit unusual. We have two zones up front and those same two front zones control the middle area here. But then the third row gets its own zone with two tiny little air vents, one on each side. I've relocated this seat to the same position as the one on the other side so we can see how this fits. And, you know, I suppose I might be able to do this sitting right here behind myself. I have maybe half an inch, a quarter an inch of leg room here. I could sit a little bit further forward and you absolutely could put six people in here if you had to in a pinch. I'm sure the tight dimensions sound ridiculous to shoppers out there that are looking at an MDX or a Q7 or a Volvo XC90 because these third row seats are definitely smaller than all of those other options. But if you're shopping for an RX and you're wishing for a little bit more room, that's exactly what this is about. You could put six or seven people in here if you absolutely had to. Ideally, they should be small. Ideally, they should be above the knee amputees, but it is possible. And then of course, we get the extra cargo room behind. And now to the cargo area. As I said before, the regular RX has an unusually small cargo area, to be honest, about 18 cubic feet. If you get the three row version, then we get eight cubic feet behind the third row, just about enough room to put some of these 22 inch roller bags in this position. You could even tilt them up right like that, just in the middle and just barely close it. But for most luggage, it's probably gonna have to be rotated around in that position. You could put about three of these carry on bags behind the third row. Most people, however, are likely going to keep the third row seats folded most of the time. And if you do that, then we get 33 cubic feet, nearly double what we find in the regular RX. Finally, putting this in direct competition to some of those larger compact crossovers that are priced about the same as the RXL. Only the RXL is going to give you the emergency third row. Since most people are likely to keep the third row folded most of the time, Lexus doesn't even bother giving us anywhere for this roller cargo cover to snap in behind the third row and shelter that area. There are only holes for this to go behind the second row. If we lift up the load floor, then we find an area where you can put the roller cargo cover if you want to store it away. It kind of goes in at an unusual angle there. And then you notice we have a tire iron and a jack under there because we don't have a can of fix flat. There is actually a spare tire in the RX 450L. Logically, Lexus could have given us a bit more cargo room, perhaps a bit more rear leg room, but instead they chose to give us that spare tire. I think that's an okay trade. 
The bulk of this interior is the same as the last time we took a look at the RX. Really, the major changes have to do with the infotainment system. So we still have a pretty standard sized moonroof just over the driver and front passenger's heads. High adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger. This model has both heated and ventilated seats, and as you can see, the bolstering is not terribly aggressive on the seat back and seat bottom cushion, so larger folks shouldn't have any troubles finding a good driving position. On the front doors, we find a small amount of real wood trim, a little bit less than we've found in Lexuses of the past, but there are a wide variety of different wood options. Some of them really have sort of a nautical or boat-like theme to them. Those are probably the ones I like the best. They're strips of wood and strips of metal interspersed with one another. We have metallic effect trim there on the door. That's not a real wood strip, and then a soft touch armrest. The after stitching continues as we move on over to the dashboard. This is an injection molded dashboard that has been after stitched, so the stitches aren't really holding anything together, but it does dress up the look a bit. Again, more of that metallic effect trim going on there. And then we have a smallish glove compartment here. I was not able to fit an iPad inside. In the middle of the dashboard, we find the infotainment system LCD. This has been relocated to be a little bit closer to the driver and front passenger. And most importantly, it's now a touchscreen. You'll notice that versus the launch of this generation RX, the bezel around the screen has changed a little bit. A nice touch is that you can use the entire screen for Apple CarPlay, which is something that we don't see in all the luxury competition. On the downside, the screen is a little bit far away. So even though it's a touch screen and that is a lot easier to use to interact with Apple CarPlay, the distance is pretty far. The other thing that you'll notice about this software is that Lexus hasn't really done anything with the rest of the software package to make it more touchscreen friendly. So if we're over here, for instance, on the navigation display, I have to hit the menu button in the center console to bring up the menu to go back to Apple CarPlay or hit that menu button down there to go, I don't know, over to the audio interface if I want to use Sirius XM. And then again, hit that menu button if I want to go over here and adjust the climate control or adjust the vehicle settings. Then once you're in these displays, you can use the touchpad or of course you can use the touchscreen to interact with them. I was surprised that they didn't make any updates to this interface because this software was originally designed for a touchscreen interface. That's one of the reasons that I'm not a huge fan of the Lexus remote controller, whether we're talking about the trackpad or their little mousy joystick thing. Below that, we have an analog clock and two large air vents. We then find the controls for both the infotainment system and the three zone automatic climate control system, physical buttons for the inputs, optical disc player there. The front and rear climate control zones can be controlled via a combination of these buttons and the infotainment system. You find the engine start stop button there. There's a gated shifter, a storage area where you could keep some smartphones. There's also some charge only USB ports, the controls for the heated and ventilated seats. This is a little area where you could put parking tickets or some of the thinner smartphones, auto brake hold, an electric parking brake right there, two large cup holders, and then one of my least favorite input methods for an infotainment system, the Lexus touchpad. But again, you don't really have to use this much in this version of the RX because we simply hit the menu button and then you can touch anything you want there. There's a direct access button for the map. If you haven't seen the RX in a while, this is actually a new input method because the previous one had the little joystick thing going on there. We have the drive mode selector over here, including an EV mode button and a traction control disable button. Behind that, we have a wrist rest for that pad there, but there's no storage cubby under there like we find in other Lexus models. But you can open the center console here to reveal a fairly decently sized storage area. You could probably fit a gallon of milk in there, but you wouldn't be able to close the lid. This is where we find the two USB inputs for the infotainment system. On the driver's side, we have a fairly traditional instrument cluster with the exception that instead of a tachometer, we get the charge, eco, and power gauge over here on the left. We then have a really small multifunction color LCD in the middle. This gives us things like the torque distribution of the hybrid system, fuel economy, your trip computer readouts, status of the vehicle's active safety systems, and certain vehicle settings, primarily the ones that relate to active safety, or if you have the optional heads-up display, the heads-up display as well. The steering wheel is an attractive three-spoke design that I really wish would also be used in the Lexus NX because this feels much more premium than in the smaller Lexus crossover. It's a wood steering wheel with leather inserts right here. So we have wood down at the bottom, wood up at the top. You'll find the controls for the infotainment system on the left side, controls for that multifunction LCD over here on the right, page change button and back button right there. There's also a button for the lane keeping assistance system and then a distance button because the remainder of the cruise controls are down here on a stock. This is one of Lexus's older steering wheel designs. It seems like newer Lexus's models have the cruise controls right there on the front. On the back, we have paddle shifters up on the right and then down on the left. 
This does use a hybrid system, but it's going to imitate ratios with these paddles. As I've said before, paddle shifters on a CVT are about as useful as paddle shifters on a French Poodle, but there is one thing to know about this particular hybrid system. It doesn't really use a CVT. Lexus calls it an eCVT, or they have in the past, because that's probably the best way to describe the theory of operation, but this absolutely does not use a belt and pulley style CVT like we find in Nissan products or in something like a Corolla. Instead, the Lexus system employs two motor generator units and a planetary gear set to imitate a transmission, for lack of a better word. And the key thing to know there is that effective gear changes are actually much more rapid. These feel a little bit more like a traditional automatic. The most important thing to know about the RX out on the road is that Lexus is going after a very different kind of customer than BMW is with the BMW X5. This is certainly tuned towards the softer, more relaxed, more comfortable, more isolated side of the segment. So if you want something that's overtly sporty, that's gonna handle the corner carving that you might wanna do out on your favorite winding mountain road, that's not necessarily gonna be the RX, even in the F Sport version. Now Lexus knows that not all Lexus customers can be pigeonholed so easily, so they do have that F Sport version that is gonna be a little bit firmer and handle a little bit better than the model that I'm driving here, but the difference is not going to be enormous. Thanks to the additional weight of the hybrid system and the longer body in this particular model, this ran 0 to 60 in 7.9 seconds, slower than the last RX that we tested, which was a shorter RX 350. Bearing in mind that this vehicle does not have enormous tires on it like we find in some of the German competition, and again that curb weight, 60 to 0 happened in 134 feet. That's certainly on the long side of the segment. Something like a Mercedes-Benz GLE or a BMW X5, they'll stop nearly as short as a compact luxury performance sedan. But again, the mission of the RX is quite different. And you will notice that when you get this out on a winding mountain road like we're on here, this is certainly not as fun to drive as the BMW X5. And that's why when it comes to handling, I'm gonna give this model a C. Pretty much all of the competition is gonna be a bit more engaging out on your favorite winding mountain road, whether you're taking a look at something like an Acura MDX hybrid or a Volvo XC90 or XC60. And those comparisons are a little bit tricky, of course, because this is not quite the same size as something along the lines of an Audi Q7 or a Volvo XC90. So you could very easily compare this against some of those compact luxury alternatives based on price, or some of the slightly larger luxury alternatives based on size, like the X5 or the GLE. The very mission of the RX is the reason that I prefer the RX with the hybrid system. It just fits the personality a bit better. The hybrid system has often been described as having a CVT, but that's not correct in the truest sense of the word. Lexus hybrid systems do not use a belt and pulley style CVT like we find in Nissan's products. This uses a planetary power split hybrid system, which Toyota and Lexus described as a CVT for quite a long time, and now they've sort of backed away from that description because it wasn't the best way to describe the way things are going on. The key thing to know about this system is that if I floor it, the engine is gonna hang out at one specific RPM as you accelerate. That's why some people equate it to CVTs. But in sort of the truer sense of the word, this feels a little bit more like an electrified drivetrain because we get a reasonable amount of torque and that happens much more instantly than you'd find in a traditional CVT design. With this hybrid system, it's important to remember that while we get over 300 horsepower total, the vast majority of that is happening on the front axle. So this is never gonna feel like the Volvo XC90 plug-in hybrid. In tight corners like this, if you were to just crank the wheel and then floor it, you're not really going to get the rear end of the vehicle pushing around like you can in the XC90, which is able to send more power to the rear axle thanks to its larger battery pack. But like the XC90 and front wheel drive competitors, you will get certainly some torque steer in straight line acceleration. That's because so much power is happening up front and there's no mechanical connection to the rear wheels. But again, I don't think that's too much of a problem for the mission of the RX as a more isolated luxury crossover. Out on a rougher road, this certainly has one of the best rides in this segment. I'm going to give this an A plus when it comes to the ride quality. Now that doesn't mean that the RX has a floaty body ride. It stays pretty level in the corners, but there's certainly a bit more tip and dive, a little bit more body roll than you'd expect in the German competition. The compensation for that is a very comfortable ride and a very quiet cabin. At 69 and a half decibels, this is one of the quietest entries in the segment and really matches the last BMW X5 that we tested. If you want something quieter than this out on the road, you aren't gonna have very many options in North America. And that's why this certainly gets an A plus when it comes to the cabin noise. Thanks to the hybrid system, the RX 450 also gets an A plus when it comes to fuel economy. Over a week of mixed driving, I've been averaging 29.2 miles per gallon in this particular model. That puts it a little bit above most of the hybrids that this might be competing with. On the other hand, this is not a plug-in hybrid like we do find in the European competition. And those plug-in hybrid options will have a few advantages. You'll be able to use them in the carpool lane solo in states like California. And they theoretically could help reduce your gasoline consumption and 
transfer some of your energy consumption from gasoline over to electricity, possibly reducing costs. The counterpoint to that is that this Lexus hybrid system is likely the most reliable entry in this segment. And that would include the regular non-hybrid version of the RX. Lexus and Toyota hybrids have proved to be incredibly reliable, and that applies to this hybrid system just like it does to the Prius, the Toyota Camry hybrid, etc. The reason for the high reliability is that Lexus hybrids are actually mechanically very, very simple. Much more simple than the average 8, 9, or 10 speed automatic. Of course, as I've said before, the one problem I find with the RX Hybrid's fuel economy numbers is that I wish it was much higher in the 30s. On a longer road trip with this, you'll probably end up averaging about 24 miles per gallon like I did on a road trip down to Santa Barbara, and you could get slightly better fuel economy in some of the plug-in hybrids out there. The model that comes instantly to mind is the XC90 T8 plug-in hybrid. It's going to give you very similar fuel economy when driving as a hybrid, it's going to give you an all-electric range, and it's going to give you 400 horsepower with significantly better performance than we find in the RX. But as I keep saying, it's not quite the same thing. So quite simply, the easiest way to describe the RX is as the quietest, most comfortable entry in this segment. So if you're looking for something that is quiet, comfortable, reliable, fuel efficient, but not as exciting to drive as the European competition, that's exactly why you want to look at the RX. The Lexus RX is frequently lampooned in some luxury circles, but the sales success simply can't be denied. The RX is the best-selling luxury crossover in the United States. It outsells the BMW X5 and the Mercedes-Benz GLE combined. The RX sold so well in 2019 that it outsold the Acura MDX by about 2 to 1. Why is that? Well, pricing certainly has something to do with this. It starts at $45,070, about $15,000 less than most of the German alternatives. So clearly the RX is going to be a value alternative to something like an X5 or a GLE or even something like an Audi Q8. The RX also sells on Lexus's dependability and reliability reputation. Although it's difficult to predict any new vehicle reliability out there, chances are the Lexus is going to be the most reliable entry in this segment for 2020 and for 2021. So if you're planning on buying your luxury two-row crossover and you're going to keep it for 10 years or 12 years or 15 years, the Lexus RX is likely going to be less expensive all the way around. And then there's the nature of the RX. It's certainly more relaxed, more comfortable, more isolated than most of the European competition. So if that's what you're looking for, again, the RX is going to be a great choice. Comparisons for the RX can be a little bit tricky because there aren't very many options in the luxury segment that are the same sort of thing as the RX. Really, the closest I think we get is the Lincoln Nautilus, and that's going to be our first competitor here. And I think the toughest competitor, because the Nautilus is about the same size, Lincoln is also clearly going for something that's a little bit more isolated, a little bit more comfortable, not quite as performance-oriented as we find in the German options. But then on the other hand, Lincoln gives you the option of a 2.7-liter twin-turbo V6 that is certainly going to be peppier feeling than the naturally aspirated V6 that we find in the Lexus. Lincoln has honestly had pretty decent reliability ratings overall. The Nautilus starts about $4,000 less than the Lexus, and although it might be a little bit less reliable than the RX, chances are you're unlikely going to see four or $5,000 worth of unreliability over a lifespan of about 10 years. On the other hand, if you're interested in saving gas, there's no hybrid version of the Lincoln at this time, but we do have two engines to choose from, the 2.0-liter turbo in the base model, 2.7-liter turbo in the up-level model. The interior is large and comfortable in the Nautilus. It has a bigger cargo area than we find in the Lexus RX, and although the interior is feeling a little bit dated for 2020, there's going to be a significant refresh coming for 2021, and the interior is getting a complete makeover to look more like the Lincoln Aviator and the Lincoln Navigator. Lincoln has not shared any official details on the 2021 Nautilus just yet, but there are a ton of spy shots out there on the web, so be sure and hunt those down. The big change inside seems to be the infotainment screen and the layout of the dash. It's getting a newer, wider format display, but I don't know what software it's going to get. And if it gets the same software that we see in the rest of the Lincoln lineup and the same speed processor that we see, for instance, in the Lincoln Aviator, then the Lexus may have a bit of a benefit. That large display right there in the dashboard is definitely large and gorgeous. The input method does take a lot of getting used to, but I like the fact that we now have a touchscreen. Next up, we have the Acura MDX, which, to be honest, I've never really seen as a direct competitor to the Lexus RX, but oddly enough, Lexus thinks that it is, and so does Acura. And a number of people that I personally know that have bought either an RX or an MDX 
somehow cross-shopped the other one. What's odd about this pairing is that the RX, until we got the RXL, has always been a two-row crossover, and the MDX has essentially always been a three-row crossover. Admittedly, the MDX does not have an enormous third row. It's not as big as the closely related Honda Pilot or as something like an Infiniti QX60, but it still has a much roomier third row than we find in the RXL. It seems that many folks that are shopping perhaps for something like the MDX are not really interested in a daily use third row. They're after something that's a bit more occasional use or perhaps they don't even care about the third row at all. In this mashup, the Acura certainly has the value proposition going for it. It's $4,000 or so less expensive than the RX and there's also a hybrid version available. But the hybrid is going in a different direction than we see in the Lexus hybrid. It's certainly after a more dynamic, interested shopper. The Acura certainly wins on price here. It's going to be several thousand dollars less than the Lexus, comparably equipped all the way on up the product line. Acura has their super handling all-wheel drive system in the MDX available, and that really will make a big difference when it comes to handling. The MDX is certainly going to be more fun, it's going to feel more nimble out on the road, but the downside to the MDX at the moment is the 9-speed ZF automatic transmission. This is the same 9-speed auto that a number of other Honda, Acura, and FCA products have used. It's basically the same 9-speed that we find under the hood, for instance, of the Chrysler Pacifica. It's just not as smooth as the Isen 8-speed that Lexus uses, or really any of the other luxury segment transmissions. If you get the MDX Hybrid, then it uses an entirely different transmission and a very different hybrid setup to the one that we see in the Lexus RX. The MDX Hybrid is going to feel much more traditional out on the road. It uses a dual-clutch transmission, which feels more like a traditional automatic, and it has a torque vectoring setup in the rear, where it has two electric motors that can either drive the rear axle together, or it can actually split them apart and drag one wheel while powering the other to give you a feeling very similar to Acura's super handling all-wheel drive system, but it's never going to be quite the same in terms of feel. It is, however, always going to be pretty superior to the feel that we find in the Lexus Hybrid. On the downside for the MDX, reliability certainly isn't where it used to be. Acura and Honda have both had some stumbles when it comes to reliability lately, so the RX is definitely going to be the more reliable option in terms of predicted reliability. Next up, we have the other Japanese option, the Infiniti QX60. This is also going to be likely less reliable than the Lexus. It uses a continuously variable transmission, so it's not going to be quite as engaging, and the overall tuning of the QX60 makes it feel bigger, a little bit more ponderous, a little bit more isolated, a little bit softer than we see even in the Lexus RX. In a way, that makes sense because the QX60 is the most family-friendly entry in this segment. It has a very usable third row, it has a decently sized cargo area, it's relatively quiet and fuel efficient, and the second row will allow you to leave a child seat latched into place for easy access to the third row, something that we don't find in any of the other luxury segment options. Comparably equipped, the Infiniti is going to be less expensive than the Lexus, but it also is going to feel older than the Lexus inside and out. I like the general styling of the QX60, but it's certainly getting on in years. That's why we're going to be getting an all-new QX60, likely for the 2022 model year. We'll probably see that on sale in late 2021, and we'll see the pre-production prototype versions probably on the web maybe about late October. Last but not least, we have the Cadillac X-T5. The X-T5 has really been clawing its way up the sales charts lately, and for 2020, it looks like it's going to be the second best-selling crossover in this segment. In terms of design, the Cadillac follows a formula that's pretty similar to the Lexus and the Lincoln. It's a front-wheel drive vehicle, you have your choice of a 2.0-liter turbo or a 3.6-liter V6, and an in-house designed 9-speed automatic transmission. It's not the ZF1 that we find under the hood of the MDX, so it shifts totally differently. It feels very much like the transmission that we see in the Lexus. My problem with the X-T5 is that it does seem a little bit expensive. The interior fit and finish is not quite where we see the Lincoln Nautilus even in its current version, not quite where we see the Lexus RX either, but it is fairly expensive, especially if you get carried away with options. Now admittedly, Cadillac is probably going to have better deals going on, but those deals do vary, and they're not quite as aggressive as we see in some of the other divisions of General Motors. So the price tag is likely going to be less than the RX, but it's not going to be perhaps as big of a delta as we see in something like the Infiniti QX60. At least for the moment, bottom lining the RX is pretty easy for me. If you're shopping for one, I would definitely get the RXL. Even if you're not planning on using that third row, the main reason for getting the L is the extra cargo capacity that we find in the back. And the regular RX does have a strangely compact cargo area compared to some of the other midsize options out there. And then of course, there is that third row, because even though it's teeny tiny and seems almost useless, I would rather have an emergency third row than not have one at all. I think it's actually a great asset to the RX. Now, it absolutely does not replace Lexus's need to deliver a larger three-row crossover, something that's more of a direct competitor 
competitor to the Lincoln Aviator or a BMW X5 with a three row or a BMW X7, a segment that is definitely getting very hot in America, but I would still get one with that teeny tiny third row just because it's more useful than not having one at all. But I have to admit, I would also wait for the 2021 Aviator to see what that would look like. I would also put the Lincoln Nautilus on your shopping list. We have that 2.7 liter twin turbo V6 available. That's certainly going to be peppier than any of the engines that we find in the RX. It may not have a teeny tiny third row behind the second row, but it does have a much larger cargo area than we find in the regular RX as well. It's going to be a little bit less expensive. And if you can wait till 2021, we're going to get that interior refresh. I'm really intrigued to see what that refresh exactly brings the Nautilus, because if it is basically a scaled version of the interior that we find in the Aviator, then it may be one of the best interiors in the segment. I already think it's a hair nicer than what we find in the Cadillac XT5. And if it brings again that scaled version of the Aviator, then it's possible that it actually may beat the Lexus in the segment as well. Be sure and let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. And what would you pick if you were shopping in this segment? Would you be interested in something like the Lincoln or would you be attracted perhaps by something like a Toyota Highlander, which is all new? and less expensive than the Lexus while delivering definitely better fuel economy in its hybrid edition. Be sure and find me over at Facebook, over at Instagram, all those other social places, and I'll see all of you next week.